Hello, my lucid learners and my bright, eager, young and young-minded students. My name is Benjamin Faust, and today we're going to talk about how poor countries become rich. Let's get started over here. We're going to talk about an idea called convergence. Now, convergence, you know, coming together, con means with, converge, you know, you can merge on an interstate, I guess that rhymes with converge, but coming together of what we mean by convergence in economics is coming together of poor nations to rich nations. So let me give you a little chart here. Over here it represents how high or low on the chart here represents our income, how much is coming in per year, and over here is across time. What you have here is in green, I put the rich countries. As you'll notice, they're growing, but their growth in income is slow. Sometimes it stalls out, may even go down a little bit, but it keeps growing. Poor countries, I kind of drew it the similar way. You know, they, they might have dips and stuff. They stay pretty low, but they might have some growth, and you're seeing some growth patterns there as well. So what happens when a country converges? This is not just convergence. It doesn't just happen magically, and actually the reason I have seven numbers and an asterisk over to the side is there are certain things countries can do that will cause or help cause them to converge with a rich nation, and we'll get to that in just a second. What happens, and this has happened over and over, is something like this. You have a nation that begins to you know, behave better or circumstances are better, whatever the case may be, and they begin their journey, they break away from the pack, they experience a very high growth rate and they converge, growth rate slows down as they reach it, and they converge with a rich nation. You're seeing this right now with China. China is somewhere close to middle income territory, very high growth rate. You know, your growth rate's up here and maybe even down here, 1% to 2% a year, maybe. You know, the United States used to be about 3% a year. Right now we're not. So, um, but on these converging nations, you're going to see much higher percentages. China so far has peaked several years ago. They had a 14.7% quarter or year, I forget, but 14.7% compared to 2 or 3% um, if they weren't converging or if they weren't. You saw the same pattern with the four Asian tigers beginning maybe in the 1960s. The four Asian tigers being Singapore, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, and Hong Kong. All right, so you see this, you saw this with... Um, you're seeing it, you're seeing some of this happen now, like I said, with China, you're seeing a little bit with India, things like that. That's how it works, but again, it is not just convergence, it is conditional, meaning there are certain conditions on which this happens. If you're poor and you have kind of a bad system set up, you're going to typically stay, stay poor unless something improves. So let's talk about that. This, by the way, the, this list is based on some work done. Uh, it's compiled by, it was uh, primarily done by uh, Robert Barrow, who's a senior fellow uh, of the Hoover Institution at Stanford, but he's most known for teaching at Harvard, and I believe he's still at Harvard. I'm not sure. He, he's probably in his 70s by now. So uh, this is based on his work. He's a highly influential uh, macroeconomist. The first one, and these are in order of what I decided to do them in, not in any particular order. Um, is rule of law. Last week I did a video that got some people watching it and a lot of people said this because you are bright students like I said at the beginning you are bright eager students and you know this rule of law. By the way how he got this data is he looked at um, over a hundred countries over almost 40 years and he watched the ones that were converging like this uh, and he watched what and he watched as many factors as he could get data for, and that's how he came up with this list. So rule of law includes protection of, you're thinking of, you know, order, and that's through protection of life and property, basically. You don't want to do business if you're going to get robbed. You also don't want to be do business if you're going to get killed. In addition, contract enforcement is important. Also having fair courts, and uh, in general, having a strong government, because a lot of governments are not strong, to enforce existing laws, or at least enforce the laws that are relevant to doing well in a society that is trying to better itself through converging, becoming more wealthy. The second thing is higher life expectancy. And this was measured at the start of convergence, but what it means is if you have 
this is probably a marker for other issues. There might be health issues, there might be unsanitary conditions. But if you're, think about it though, if you're preoccupied in a nation and you're trying to become wealthy and you're preoccupied with things like, um, you know, people are dying at a very young age, how are you going to get the knowledge from the elders? There may not be elders to get knowledge from. You're preoccupied in, you know, basically having children to replenish yourselves and uh, death and disease are everywhere <laughs> if, if you have a low life expectancy. So keeping that high or raising that can help your convergence. Um, you should have low inflation. And the number I'm going to give you is going to be shocking if you're from a Western country. If it is below, if it is above 15 to 20 percent, which is high for the West, for developed nations, is high. So if you're below that, you've got pro, you're okay. Okay, for a developing nation, if you're down here and you're 15 percent, it's probably not so bad. If you're 30 percent, you're starting to have problems. It's gonna gonna stop your growth. Inflation. It's a predictor that well, it's probably a predictor of problems with your your governance and your uh, and stuff like that. But if your uh, if your inflation is high, people can't hold money. It's hard to save. It's hard to do business because you're constantly worried about the the money falling in value. That's why lower inflation. All right. Kind of related to this, if you watch past videos of mine, lower government consumption or government spending. If the government is spending all the money in the economy, or most of it, or the lion's share, or at least a, a large percentage of it, you can't have that innovation that happens when you, you turn it over to the free market. Um, typically, not always, but typically your, your free market, your individuals, firms, and businesses, and all that, they do much better job of, uh, of, of figuring out how to do things more efficiently than does the government, and thus, if the government spending is too high, they don't have a chance to do that. Next one is you want more favorable terms of trade. Terms of trade is this. When you are exporting stuff from your country, how much import stuff can you buy? How much can you buy for what you're exporting? And more favorable, it could be um, it's related to currency. If your currency is strong, you're going to have a more favorable term a lot of times. It's, again, hooked into these things here. If you have lower government spending, you're less likely to have high inflation and you're likely to have more favorable terms of trade. That's an important factor. Number six, now this is controversial. You want higher, well the first part isn't, but when I get to, you'll see, you'll, <laughs> oh just wait. Yeah, I can, already, I can already see the comments. I can hear them in my mind. Okay, higher educational attainment for, uh, here we go, for, yeah, I've, I've salted this a lot, it better be good, for males, okay, for males. Now, higher education, meaning college, university, and higher education, meaning secondary education, primary education with males was not really a factor. Why is it males? Here's the elephant in the room. Why is it males? Because if, if nobody's told you yet, Men and women are different, okay? So men, when they go through their career cycle, they tend to do things like emphasize career, maximize income. Women tend to do well. In Western countries, they do well until about age 30. When they start having kids, it drops off. In poor countries, women have kids a lot sooner. So they're not as invested in the traditional workforce. They work domestically. They work at home. Uh, typically, not every woman, okay? I'm, again, I'm hearing the voices. Yeah, here, calm down. It's okay. Educational attainment for males, meaning going to high school, going to college, and of course going to primary school because you have to get through primary school to, to be able to do that. Now, education is indirectly related to women for a number of factors, quality of life, eventual um, you know, political reasons later on down, getting more favorable political climate. But as far as women go, here's their contribution, lower fertility, lower fertility rates, Okay, now, in my opinion, this does not mean passing out birth control and giving away abortions because if you look at rich countries, once you're up here, you have this issue where you don't have enough people to replace yourself. All right, and can you kind of spike the system by doing more abortions, doing more birth control in order to get, achieve this effect faster? Absolutely, China's doing it right now. China also has a shrinking workforce. They've had a shrinking workforce since 2012. They also have a shortage of workers in certain sectors, 
and they've got looming economic problems because of it. They've got that upside down family tree where one kid, two parents, four grandparents, and it's kind of upside down. And that naturally will happen, especially in Asian countries, it's happening in Japan, when they get up here, but they're not even up there yet. So it's a big mystery what's gonna happen. They may get trapped in middle income territory. They may have political problems down the future. We don't know. So I'm not saying we just need to pass out the pill, but what I'm saying is if you keep, here's a, here's a good one. In fact, when they did this study, you took primary school and women, and primary school helped the economy as probably a variable because if women are in primary school, they're not having kids at a young age, kind of delays. So I think, you know, maybe women could go to college in poor countries too, uh, get, their, um, get their education, delay the childbearing. It just means uh, it, it would be a perfectly appropriate to delay the childbearing. It would accomplish that. Now, here are your seven. There's a star, there's an eighth factor, but it is not universal because of this. I'm gonna to have to destroy the chart, so hopefully you enjoyed that. We're gonna talk about democracy and whether or not it helps. So over here was income, over here was time. Let's make, uh, down here is just going to be like, uh, where's my black marker? All right, over here is going to be level of democracy. I'm just gonna put a D there for level of democracy. Down here I'm gonna put, uh, it's gonna be different countries, C for countries. It has an, um, what we call a nonlinear relationship. It's like a parabola. There out there, somewhere for each country is an optimal level, oh, for optimal, <laughs> optimal level of democracy. So if you're, if you're a poor country, if you are a converging nation, or if you're a um, uh, developing, I guess is the, correct, uh, the politically correct term, if you're developing and you're like, you know, if you're, I would say India is probably on this side of it. We'll put an I for India. If you're India, you've got a fair amount of democracy. It may not necessarily help you to add more democracy because it has a negative effect on, actually, this would be, I, I do this. This is why part of me wants to do these videos and then edit them, but that takes more time and I have a job and I have my container garden. And so what happens is I make mistakes and then people are like, you're not qualified to do this even though I am. So. This is not, that was wrong, what I told you before. This is the level of democracy. This is the level of democracy's effect on the economy, okay? So your best effect is this level, this optimal level of democracy, okay? Right, so, now, uh, India, if they add more democracy, they're gonna get less benefits. Now, you take another nation, one of my favorites, <laughs> He and I have the same body type, the leader, North Korea, DPRK, you know, they have a low level democracy. If they add just a little bit, they're going to see huge returns. But if you already have democracy, if you're India, it's not going to do you a ton of good to add more democracy. Why is that? Because people vote for things they shouldn't. I'll just be honest with you. They want higher minimum wage. They want uh, pension plans that are overzealous. They want uh, redistribution type of stuff. It doesn't work. So. Here are your reasons, here's how you do it. I don't hate women, but the numbers say, educate your men and then keep your women maybe in school. You know, it, it benefits indirectly, it does. We're talking solely about how countries become rich. When you're talking about life circumstances, whether you're in a rich nation, poor nation, whether you're able to converge or not, you really cannot trust your government. Hopefully they're doing the right thing. You have to trust them, you don't have any choice. That's why you should always look up for your ultimate answers in life. Hope you enjoyed this today. See you next time, bye.